I'm back at it trying to answer full stack web developer interview questions to see if I have what it takes to be a full stack web developer. Last time I did pretty good, so let's see if I can keep up that streak this time. Welcome back to Web Dev Simplified. My name is Kyle and my job is to simplify the web for you so you can start building your dream project sooner. And today I'm gonna to be attempting to solve a full stack web developer interview. There's a ton of different interview questions here. I have a simple script that's gonna get me a random question. I'm gonna see if I can get them all correct. Also, I highly recommend you play along as well. Try to solve them before I give you the answer and we can compare how we did. So let's just jump to the very first question here. And the first question we have here is what is short circuit evaluation in JavaScript? Now this is a topic that I've either written a blog article or a video on somewhere, I'm going to link it if I can find it, but essentially short circuit evaluation is how AND and OR statements work in JavaScript. If you write the code true AND AND, like false for example, it'll evaluate the true statement first and then it'll evaluate the false statement next and overall it'll give you a result of false. But what happens if you do the opposite, if you put false first, then AND 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 then true? Well it's going to evaluate false and it's like okay it's false. And JavaScript is smart enough to know that false plus anything else is going to be false when you and them together. So it's not even gonna run the rest of your code. So if you have like some code that's going to log out the text high and it returns the value of false, and you have some other code that's going to log out the text by and it returns true, if you put the one that actually does the false statement first, it's not actually going to run the one that prints out by which returns true. So that's kind of a complicated way of explaining it. Let's see if they have an easier way of explaining it here. Short circuit evaluation, essentially left or right. So everything goes left or right. And you can see here when we have true, we already know no matter what this is, whether it's false or true, it's always going to return true. So it doesn't run the second half of the statement. Same here, it does not run the second half of the statement. So this is really useful if you need to do short circuit evaluation, like in React, you're going to see this all the time. Now let's try to get another question here. Here we go. This one is what is context? I believe I already did that in the last video, so I'm just gonna skip that one. And we're gonna go here. What is the purpose of a callback function as an argument of set state? So this is a React-based question, and this question is entirely based around the second purpose of using set state. So normally when you do set state, you could be like, set state to zero, for example, to set the count of something to zero, and that's going to give you zero as your state. But what happens if you wanna increment the count by one? You have a function called set count, which is like for your use state hook, and it updates your count. If you set it to count plus one, that's actually going to be incorrect because it's relying on state that was previously set. And in order to use previous state to update your current state, you need to use the function version of set state. And the function version just takes in the current value of the state and you return the new value. So that's how you can properly use the current value of your state. For example, in this counter version, let's say that when you press a button, you want to increase the state count by two. And instead of just doing it by adding two, you instead use two separate set states that add one to the value. If in this first hypothetical example, you set it so that you just did count plus one and count plus one, that is going to be incorrect because it'll set your take your count variable, which in our case is zero, it'll add one and now you'll have one as your count. And the second set count function is going to still have the same zero as your count variable, it'll add one and it'll set the count to one again. Well, if you use the function version, that parameter that's passed to the function will start out as zero and then it'll update to one. And then when you call the function a second time, it'll be one and then it'll update to two when you add one to it. So let's look at the answer here just to make sure. Uh, do, 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 gets rendered and set sent state is asynchronous. The callback function is used for any post action. Let's see here, set state there. Okay, this is not at all what I was thinking here. Yeah, so this is interesting. I didn't even know this was a thing inside of set state, but apparently you can have some code that runs after your component is re-rendered. I think that's what it's saying. Yeah. Okay, so this is something that you would never really use ever, is even says right here, recommend don't use this. So that's really interesting and it's invoked after set state finishes. So that's super weird. I've never seen this before. It might be something that's only class component based. I'm not 100% sure, but honestly, probably something you're never gonna run into. And the other version of passing a callback to set state is a much more common use case. So I guess I technically got that one wrong, but let's move on to the next question. How to apply pop validation in React? This is an interesting question. So there's two ways you could do this. The first way would be just use TypeScript and obviously everything's gonna be checked with TypeScript. So that'll validate the types of your props are correct. Pretty straightforward. The second way, and I'm guessing what they're trying to ask with this question is to use prop types. So prop types is something that is a separate library you can install inside of React that allows you to specify the type of the different props you pass to your components, whether it's an object, an array, a string, number, boolean, whatever you want it to be. And then when your code runs, it'll check all these different types and it'll print out in the console if there's any error. So if, for example, you have an incorrect type being passed to one of your components, it'll give you an error in the console letting you know. 
Now the reason I like TypeScript much better than PropTypes is because TypeScript will work when you compile your code before you even run it, while PropTypes only checks your code after you run it, so it's a lot easier to miss things with PropTypes. So let's check here. Uh, yep, it's saying we define prop types in the component. That's exactly what they're saying to do. And yeah, they're saying it's not mandatory right here. Prop types is not mandatory. However, it's good practice. I would even go so far as to say that prop types are fine if you're using no TypeScript, but if you want good type safety, just use TypeScript instead. It's going to be much better than prop types. And overall, in my opinion, is just a much better experience. So let's move on to the next question. Luckily, I at least got that one right. We're what, two for three? Okay, here we go. This is a question that is very easy for me to answer. Are semicolons required in JavaScript? I've done an entire video on why I don't use semicolons when I write my JavaScript code, so I can safely say that semicolons are technically not required when you write your JavaScript, but the reason for this is because the JavaScript, when it's being compiled and ran on the browser, it'll just automatically insert in the semicolons for you, so you technically don't need to put them in yourself because the browser is going to insert them for you. And if we look at the answer here, we can say, Sometimes. Okay. So the reason they're saying sometimes, I don't even want to look at the rest of the answer here because I already know what they're trying to say here is sometimes they are required because JavaScript doesn't actually know that the new line means that you want to have a different set of code. So when you write certain pieces of code, it's going to interpret it one way when you most likely meant it another way. Technically, there's nothing wrong with the code you wrote. It's still valid code. It just doesn't do what you expect it to. So let's look at an example here. Here we go. We have a line that starts with an open bracket here or a line that starts with an open parenthesis. When you have this type of scenario, what happens is JavaScript, if you didn't have this semicolon at the beginning of the line here, it'll think that what you're trying to do is call a function or access part of an array from the previous line. So it'll essentially take all of this code here and pretend it's right after this three. So it'll try to access like an index of this value three, which is most likely not at all what you want, which is why you need to put this semicolon here to prevent that from happening. This is like the only edge case you'll ever run into if you don't use semicolons. And if you use something like prettier to automatically format your code, it's gonna be smart enough to add these in there for you. Now let's move on to another question here. So far we've only missed one, which is not too bad. Here we go. Node.js, this is a good, good question, Node.js question. Node.js often uses a callback pattern where if an error is encountered during execution, this error passes the first argument to the callback. What are the advantages of this pattern? Let's take a look here. We have the file system, we're reading a file and we have a callback being returned, which has our error and then it has our data. We can handle our error and then we have our data. Now, I think they're specifically asking what are the advantages of making sure that the error is the first value of the callback? And I think the reason that they do that is because it forces the developer to think about error checking when they're writing their code. Because if you swap this and you put the error second and the data first, you could actually write this function so it just says function parentheses data and parentheses and it doesn't actually have the error variable at all you can just leave it off completely and you'll be able to write your code and it'll work in the proper use case but if there's an error you now are no longer checking for that the reason they put this error variable first is it forces you to check the error because you now need to specify this error variable before you can get to the data variable that you really want so it's just forcing developers to think about that error case when they're writing out their code and I think that is the reason they do this. So let's check the answer here. So uh, not needing to process the data if it's not needed, having a consistent API. Uh, okay, so technically this is not really what I had mentioned in my answer. The reason they have this error prop is just so you can check for errors, which is pretty self-explanatory, I thought. I think that's really what they're saying. Practice all error convention. Okay, error first callback. So it's just, this is just an error first callback. It is what it is. Okay, yeah, so the callback function allows you to use it easily. So it's like kind of what I said, maybe a little bit more involved than what I said. But the main thing is that it's really important that you pass it as the first value because it makes the user think about it. Also, it makes sure that you think about it when you're passing the function. So if you like create your own function that has this callback syntax, it forces you to think about passing this error value along as well. So there we go. I think I got that one like half right. I don't know, not the best showing I've ever done. Let's move on to the next one. What is REST? Okay, this is another one I actually have an entire video on. Way back at the beginning of my channel, I made this video. And REST is essentially a format for getting data from an API that's like generally the most common way you're going to use REST. And you would think of like a REST endpoint. So a REST endpoint is where you have an endpoint that has RESTful data endpoints. So you, generally you like to think about this as resources. So you have a resource and that resource may be like a user. And then for that user, you can create, you can read, you can update, and you can delete. Those are generally the four main actions. And to do that with HTML, you're going to be doing a put action for updating, or maybe it's going to be there's another one, a patch, that's the other one. So patch and put are gonna be your update methods. Delete is gonna be for removing things. You have post for creating things and you have git for reading data. And based on REST, there's like a specific way that you format your URLs. So like to get all the users, it would be slash users. To get a single user, it'd be slash users slash one. 
to delete a single user, it would be slash users slash one, that same exact URL, but you would pass along the delete parameter. You would essentially say, hey, this is going to be a delete method. Or if you wanted to create a new user, it would be slash users, but you would use post instead to post along that extra data that you want. So it's just a specific way to format your URLs as well as the methods you pass along for that HTTP. And that's going to allow you to really easily have a standardized API and everybody's gonna know how that API works because people just understand how this REST property works. So let's look at the answer. Okay, I wasn't quite 100% sure what it REST stood for. Representational state transfer. And yeah, it exposes access to data where data is these models like post, users, or comments. And like I said here, you can have like a slash post. If you wanna create, they say slash post slash new. It's entirely dependent on like what you want to do for your API. This is just one example. Same thing with updating, you put the ID. Delete, you put the ID. But the important thing is the delete, the put, the post, or the get, those HTTP methods. Those are the really important things with REST. Okay, let's do one more really quick question here. Let's just get the next one. Can you name the four types of media properties? Okay, this is a CSS question. And I'm not actually sure if I can get this. So there's going to be like max content to be able to check the width of something or no max width. Sorry. So we have max width and min width that allows you to check the size of a container. Uh, there's like the display property. So you can have like a print display. You can have things for Braille, which I think is deprecated now. Uh, what else is there? You can do like screen to check the screen type. You can also check orientation. So like landscape versus portrait. So I guess how am I, so like there's the content sizing that'd be like min content, max content or min max width. There is the orientation, which is landscape portrait. There is the print type, like print or screen, for example. I can't think of a fourth one off the top of my head. So let's just see what they all are. This is a really tricky question, in my opinion, because you mostly are going to use like print or you're going to use the width and that's about it. Okay. So they're looking at these types. Okay, so there's all, which applies to all screen types. We have print, we have screen, and then speech, which is the one I didn't list, I guess, technically. So speech would be for screen readers, and all is just literally all of them. So, okay, that's a little bit of a confusing question, in my opinion, because when I think of, like, media queries, I think of, like, min content, max content, or min with max with that kind of stuff. But, yeah, these are technically the four, like, types. But there's also orientation that you can do. You can do, like, landscape versus portrait. So there's a lot more you can do with media queries than just this. But these are like the four types that you have to specify at the beginning of your media query. Otherwise, it'll just default to all. I really should have gotten this question right, though, because I have a full video on CSS media queries. And now that I think about it, I actually remember specifically talking about these different types. So I definitely should have got this right. That did not go quite as smoothly as the first time I did this. It was still a ton of fun. And I really enjoyed it. And if you want to check out that first time, it's going to be linked over here. And I definitely think I'm going to try this for a third time as long as you show some interest. With that said, thank you very much for watching and have a good day.